consumers today are like a little less receptive to the megaphone strategy and more receptive to inclusivity, right? And so how can you bring people into the fold and, and, and give them ownership? Chris, what's happening, man? How are you feeling? What's up, Sam? Good morning. It's beautiful, beautiful day, right? Uh, very excited to kick this podcast off with a bang. Uh, really want to make sure that all our listeners understand who we are, where we're coming from. For so, so for these first couple episodes, we've decided to, to do a meet your host segment where Chris and I will actually be interviewing each other about some of our experience and our perspectives on growing communities. So, so really excited before we start diving into some awesome guests to make each other the uh, uh, at least attempt at being awesome guests. So right. with that said, um, we're, I'm going to interview Chris today. Chris Whitman, if you aren't familiar, is the co-founder and chief growth officer at Crony Creative. He helps bring brands and consumers together through unique and innovative brand experiences. Prior to Crony, he was also a former sales executive in ad tech at Giant Media, where he worked with brands to help make their content go viral on the web. He also was an online video strategist for Johnson & Johnson at Universal McCann. And uh, actually where Chris and I crossed paths was back in the, uh, the underground music days when Chris was running an a underground music collective called We In Clouds and Replay Ceviche, where he uh, brought together some, some awesome communities to unite around good music and good times. So That's right. uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a fun ride, but now we're, we're good, taking good old our, days. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We don't, we don't party anymore. <laughs> Not right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, so Chris, I mean, from your perspective, obviously, I know you've been working on Crony for a while. Do you think you could just paint a, a fuller picture and some, some context around what you're currently working on with Crony and, and how you've adapted with COVID? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's definitely been an interesting year. So we started Crony. Uh, I have two other business partners, Ryan and Andreas. And we started Crony about three and a half years ago. And the whole focus of the creative agency was to kind of like kickstart business with experiential marketing at the helm. So, um, you know, we've, we've built a huge business around that and have uh, done some really awesome projects with a lot of cool brands like BuzzFeed and, um, you know, Fandom and, you know, the list goes on, High Symbiety, Billboard, so on and so forth. And uh, we've, we've gotten to work with a lot of really great brands because of that. And, um, you know, so going into 2020, it's been interesting for us because while we were already building out a lot of additional capabilities, um, including like, you know, content, doing branded content shoots, editorial lifestyle, things like that. But then also, uh, you know, the social media work that we're doing with you and Knox, um, it, you know, kind of COVID-19 slapped us in the face a little bit. You know, we were looking to kind of grow on top of, the business that we had already built and we found ourselves having to very quickly, uh, you know, more or less pivot into a different way of thinking. And, you know, I think it's been an interesting time. Like I think that uh, while COVID-19 has presented a number of challenges to the business and has presented a number of challenges to um, even just maintaining your business as a small business owner, uh, I think what's been great is that it's, uh, it's produced a, uh, a need to think innovatively uh, across the board. So how can I kind of take a lot of the real world, world things that I've been doing? How can I digitize that? How can I create um, safe experiences for consumers? So, um, you know, of course we did a lot of uh, like virtual events, um, a lot of virtual conferences, and, and we did a lot of work with you on that um, and the Knox team because uh, we realized that having that kind of pre-promotion, post-promotion, uh, social content strategy was super important to that, um, especially as it relates to building community, right? Um, you know, the great thing about in-person events is that you can connect with people um, serendipitously. You can, um, you know, kind of schedule your day around content, but, uh, you know, we're all stuck at home and it's a little, uh, it's a bit of a drag, honestly, like having to kind of look at our screens all the time. Um, you know, I'm on video calls probably 70% uh, of my day. And, you know, I've probably been multitasking more these days than I ever have, which is interesting because we talk about how COVID-19 has, you know, presumably brought a lot of work-life balance without having to, you know, commute from one place to the other. So um, it's definitely been interesting. But what I think has been uh, probably some of the cooler stuff that we've been working on these days are some of these hybrid activations. So by that, I mean, uh, we do have brands that are approaching us like Lululemon, for example, and Warner Media. Um, who are like, hey, we've got um, opportunities to engage with people in the real world. So 
how do you think about that? How do you think about community building in the context of, you know, isolation, right? Um, so obviously social uh, components are really important to that, social media, I mean, by that. Um, but even just kind of, you know, interacting with the brands in the real world, I think has been pretty interesting because if you go out there today, um, you know, because people are walking around, they, they got their masks on, they're, they're going out because, you know, they're going crazy if they just stay indoors there's really not a lot of competition. Um, and so I think that there's a huge opportunity right now for brands to be engaging people safely uh, in the real world and building community that way, um, you know, by being not necessarily bold or reckless, but by, you know, not allowing, um, you know, the, the conditions of today to necessarily like change the way that they want to engage with people. So we're finding that discoverability is really important. Um, choose your own adventure style, um, you know, activations where you can kind of go up by yourself and almost kind of like, you know, if you think about like a, uh, a trail map when you go to, you know, hike a mountain or something along those lines, um, you know, how can you kind of, uh, how can you create these beacons around an environment and allow people to kind of explore things? How can you use AR to allow people to interact um, both on site and at home. And I think that people are really um, clamoring for this uh, because, you know, it's going to be a new normal uh, for sure. And the hybrid, um, you know, real world and social and digital, it's all like, it's all coming together. Um, and I think that's really powerful and exciting, um, but it's requiring you to think through a different lens in terms of community building. So um, it's, I think it's exciting uh, to be completely candid with you. And I think that the coolest brands and, and the bravest brands right now are the ones who are, and making sure that they're not, you know, just kind of dead in the water and, um, and they can also push the boundaries a little bit, right? They can be like, what have we been doing that's been super standard as, you know, up into this time, how can we shake things up? How can we start bringing strategies together and uh, developing more cohesive opportunities? So um, yeah. it's, it's been, it's been interesting. No, I love it too. And I, I definitely think when it comes to building thorough engagement with consumers and creating that community to the extent that you can do it across different channels in the marketing mix um, is critical. So obviously leaning into social and these virtual elements, but I loved what you were talking about, like finding safe ways to, uh, I mean, we are seeing society reopen different facets, whether it's outdoor restaurants or, I mean, look at everybody working out in parks and just how many people right. are in parks these days. So being able to, to come up with these unique yet safe activations, I think does once again present itself a unique opportunity for those progressive brands too. It's like I even uh, have a friend that's part of a, a gym in, in LA and they're started, it's a spinning class and spinning gym and they're doing outdoor sessions. So it's, it's um, like, even though early on, I think you guys did a great job at adapting to the fact of shifting from IRL events to, to virtual events. Now it's fun because mm -hmm. it's getting back to that point where we, we can play in that middle ground and, and that hybrid. Right. Yeah. And I think the, you know, the data component is going to be, um, you know, even more at the foreground uh, because, because it's accelerated the way that brands have had to think about, um, you know, collating that first party data that they're, that they're, that they're getting from like an, a real world event. Um, I, I'm really excited about that piece, right? I think that there's a huge opportunity to um, move the needle forward in terms of like, how do we really think about moving a consumer um, down the funnel and, and by down the funnel, I mean like the community funnel, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, if you think about, um, you know, ex you know, think back to when you used to go to a music festival, so you mm -hmm. go to a music festival and you've got one of the cool things about going to a music festival and we've activated a lot of them is that inevitably you're going to, you're going to discover some brand that you've never heard of before that probably just got like a ton of seed money um, and is just making a go at it in terms of connecting with consumers, whatever that consumer mm -hmm. is. And so, you know, you're discovering a brand for the first time. How do you move that consumer from, you know, just experiencing you for the first time as a guest and how do you turn them into a super fan? So um, obviously that's a lot of what we're talking about on this, um, on this podcast, but uh, I think that there's going to be huge inroads made in terms of moving that needle forward uh, yeah. as we kind of continue into 2021. Yeah, for sure. And I, I love how you alluded to the fact of uh, really trying to create and turn consumers into super fans. And I, I do think that is one of those foundational elements of being able to really nurture and develop a sense of community because ultimately then those, those consumers 
And those customers uh, are now becoming super fans. They're becoming ambassadors. They're becoming advocates. They're strengthening their relationship, not only with the brand, but also with other other fellow super fans, which just creates this domino effect. So in that same vein, I mean, it's the brand community podcast. Why do you think building brand communities is so important when it comes to driving growth for brands? For sure. I mean, you know, like I said, super fans are real, right? Um, you, and, and using that music festival, uh, you know, kind of playbook that I just mentioned, I think that the biggest challenge is like, you know, you can, if you look at it through the lens of experiential marketing, for example, um, you know, it's, it's very awareness based. It's very, um, you know, more often than not, unless it's like, you know, some sort of B2B activation, I think that that's a little bit more, um, you know, down the funnel, but more often than not, it's very awareness based. So how can you as a brand, um, really relate to people, uh, who you target consumers, how can you kind of emit an ethos that is powerful to them enough to want them to be a part of that community? And I think more importantly, um, consumers today are like, you know, you use this term a lot, uh, megaphone, you know, consumers today are like a little less receptive to the megaphone strategy and more receptive to, to uh, inclusivity, right? And so how can you bring people into the fold and, and, and give them ownership, right? And that's when you start seeing these super fans. Like whenever I think of a super fan, I think of like, uh, you know, athletic apparel brands, right? So I, like, have you ever gone to the golf course and you're going to the golf course right, uh, recently, right? That's right. <laughs> Tiger. Um, so how many people have you seen just like decked out in 100% Under Armour? That's me, man. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but I mean, like Under Armour, you know, it, it like created this like cult following, right? And like most mm-hmm. athletic brands do, right? You usually like, it feels a little weird if I'm wearing, um, you know, like a Nike shirt with like Adidas pants, for example. Uh, so I think that when it comes down to it, um, building that kind of super fan audience, it's really about that connection. And the more that you have buy-in with the consumer, uh, the more that they're going to not only like consume your product, right, but they're going to advocate for it. And I think that that's, uh, that's the really exciting thing about how, um, you know, conversations have been able to be, have, have been able to like, you know, translate onto social media, but then you can also localize those conversations as, as well, right? Because, because we have all this information that we can, that we can leverage as a brand or as an agency, uh, to create really bespoke, unique conversations that feel, um, you know, feel personal to whoever the consumer is. Cause like at the end of the day, we're all different. We're all diverse. Um, one brand can't say, you know, everything to everybody. Uh, and you're also going to want to talk to a lot of different types of audiences. So, um, you know, making sure that you kind of can do that, I think is the strongest way to build that community trust. Yeah, for sure. Um, totally agree. So, I mean, in, when it comes to deploying those sorts of principles, building trust, uh, trying to, to create that sense of connection and, and super fans, can you speak through some specific examples throughout the years? I know you've been building communities for a while, both with what you're doing now with Crony, as well as in a lot of your other like prior kind of uh, engagements and endeavors. So how some specific examples as to communities you've built and, and how you've actually gone about building them would be great. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I've been building communities for ever, I feel like, um, you know, ever since, you know, junior high, high school, you're talking about like, you know, student athlete, athletics, uh, you've got um, student government uh, that I was involved in. And then going into college, you've got, um, you know, I was part of, I, I didn't think that I was going to part, be a part of Greek life, but I did an upper class pledge and uh, ended up uh, being president of Sigma Chi, and that was a very that was a very fun uh, experience. Obviously, because um, I think one of the key points in in building community is consistency uh, and kind of staying always on and making sure that your frequency is appropriate. And I've even seen this in um, you know back when we were building um, you know the, the nightlife groups, right? Uh, as part of the underground music scene here. Um, I thought that it was super fascinating that you could actually build a brand relatively quickly here in Brooklyn and in New York by just being consistent, you know, by just showing up and making sure that you're letting, you know, letting people know. And then the more that you're kind of, the more that you're uh, driving those events, the more that uh, people are showing up, the more that they're talking about it, the more that they're getting their friends to come and go and so on and so forth. And I think that there's a lot of correlation between, 
um, developing, uh, you know, a nightlife group and developing a brand. Um, so I think it's mainly about showing up and, you know, we've seen that as a hurdle, uh, from our end, right? Like we've, we put together proposals for brands where we've been like, Hey, you know, you need to show up consistently more frequently and that's going to be a real driver for you. And there's, you know, at times there's just some, um, whether it's budgetary or, you know, something's already been sold through and it's just kind of, uh, you know, you know, something that they're not willing to kind of adjust on, uh, you kind of, you get, you catch that where you're just like, okay, well, that's a miss. Um, you know, we really need to be showing up a little bit more. So I think that, uh, that's the biggest takeaway that I've seen. Yeah, for sure. And in the same vein, what do you feel are some of the, the pitfalls or, I mean, outside of like mm-hmm. not being consistent, like, um, if a brand or somebody is trying to build a community, what do you think are, are things they need to be really conscious of avoiding? So that way their, their efforts actually do translate into consistent long-term growth. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously consistency and frequency are important, um, in, in the physical sense, but also if you think about just communicating, um, you know, brand ethos and, um, you know, what kind of like contextually, where are you showing up? Right. Um, are you showing up at music festivals? Are you showing up at food festivals? Are you showing up at, um, you know, and these can be like really anywhere. Um, but at the end of the day, I think consistent messaging of like kind of the brand's ethos is really important as well. Um, you know, on top of that. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, what you really want to do is make sure the consumer feels connected uh, and then motivated to stay connected, right? So Mm -hmm. how can you, again, like we talk about this a lot, but how can you create that two-way conversation? How can you like uh, really activate somebody and and make them feel empowered to be involved in the brand? And Mm -hmm. I think that that is the biggest opportunity. And I think that we're, we're seeing... I think that there is a huge shakeup uh, with with COVID nineteen and the pandemic, and and how uh, you know I think everybody was on a roll, right? And then all of a sudden this stuff happens. So I think that there's been a lot of um, you know rethinking through strategies. But um, you know, really at the end of the day, I think brands showing up and you know in, showing intention to connect with with consumers is really important. Mm-hmm. And one of the other things that I'd like to bring up is that you know you know, we talked a lot about screen fatigue earlier and how, how it affects us, um, you know, from an activation perspective and, you know, you know, wanting to, wanting to be engaged with the, with the brand through the screen. But more importantly, like, I think that a lot, because we've, we've all got a little bit extra time, we're not commuting. Um, we're spending a little bit more time on your, on ourselves, right? Like I'm, I, I don't eat out that much. I don't order in that much, but I'm cooking a ton. Um, there's a introspective um, thing going on with the world right mm-hmm. now. I think we're all, mm-hmm. you know, I read somewhere um, somebody had called this the great pause. And I think that's, that's a great way to summarize what's going on right now to a certain extent for some of us, um, not for everybody, but um, for a lot of the people who are consuming, they're also having an opportunity to kind of sit back and think about what's important to them. And I think that the, the more brands can be keen on, on, on the picking up what those trends are uh, and then authentically engaging with those trends and, and being thoughtful about those strategies. It's going to be really interesting once things reopen because um, I'm, I'm almost certain that the, the habits and traits that I've developed over the course of, of this, of this pause period, are, I'm going to be, you know, hurtling, you know, forward with them, you know, as things mm-hmm. open back up and, and they're very much a part of me right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting time, no doubt about it, and definitely has forced us all to to adapt. But as you mentioned, there's therein lies some unique opportunities and, and ways to be progressive and innovative. And I think too now, um, people are craving community more than ever, given the fact that they're, yeah. they're, there's these times and environments when they're, they're isolated. So those opportunities when they can um, feel as if they're a sense of com- uh, there, there is a sense of community that they're not alone. Um, I mean, these are like human needs that all people want. So as a brand, if you're able to really provide that for your customers, you're, um, doing, I mean, really bringing value into their lives. Um, Absolutely. so when it comes to, um, I mean, obviously COVID has brought on its very unique and, and pressing set of 
uh, needs and, and kind of uh, impetus and catalyst to adapt and, and change around various uh, different elements of building community. But even prior to COVID, I mean, when you look over the past like five or 10 years, you know, you have a lot of experience in the, the media world and the, the mm-hmm. event and activation world. What are some of the other just general evolutions that you've seen when it comes to helping brands build communities? Let's see. So in terms of evolutions and brands building communities, I think, I mean, just, just in general, you know, the, the brand community director is like almost uh, necessary. So we, we call on a lot of emerging CPG brands, for example, and every single one of these brands has a community manager. And so what I think is really interesting is that everybody's really getting it. Um, I think that there's been a lot of tools that have been being built around how to help organize and manage your community because, you know, there's a, there's kind of like the manual and there's the automated aspect of community management. Right. Um, and I, I, the more you automate things, and this is true with all things and especially with some, you know, something like sales, for example, the more you automate, the less personalized it can be. And so I think that, um, you know, as, as we evolve, some of the bigger challenges are going to be around, um, you know, figuring out ways to be able to scale community growth um, authentically, right? And being able to find ways to, uh, you know, diversify your brand message in such a way that it feels authentic to a diverse amount of people too. Um, So, you know, I don't think that there's there's a full answer to this yet, but I do think that what's exciting is that there's a lot of companies working on tools that, to kind of help and even like crony for example we're working on a tool to uh, try to try to crack this nut for example um and figure out ways to uh you know help brand managers figure out and community managers figure out how they can move somebody from the top of the funnel down to that like super fan lower funnel aspect um but then do it at scale right like how can you do it authentically um i think that's the most important part yeah for sure for sure so when it comes to your approach with, with Crony, and I mean, if you're working with a brand, and I know you do so in, in a lot of different capacities, but like, what's the, the general approach? I mean, both from kind of like a discovery standpoint, all the way through the elements of execution. How, if I'm running a brand, and I mean, what, where do you start? And how do you, what do you work towards? Yeah, I think, I, I think it's kind of like what, what we've been forced to do with COVID-19, right? So a lot of times, you know, pre, pre-pandemic, it was a lot of just kind of, you know, do some data collection when you do the activation and um, that data then goes into a black box, right? And you're not, you're really not quite sure what happens with it or what kind of actionable uh, insights you can glean from that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, as we've kind of gone from, you know, IRL to, you know, virtual and even hybrid, for example, uh, it's allowed us to think more, it, uh, think more about like what's, what's kind of like our pre-event strategy. How are we staying on top of consumers during that time period? How are we driving consumers to those events? Um, if they're virtual or hybrid, for example, and then how are we, you know, making sure that that message is still getting out, um, and still staying on top of, uh, the minds of the consumers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then more importantly, like, you know, let's make sure that this isn't one off, right? Like, Uh, It goes back to that whole consistency thing. It goes back to the whole, uh, you know, driving the campaign as, as you know, across the year as opposed to um, kind of just showing up over the summer months. Um, So how can you kind of stay in front of somebody uh, from a seasonal basis and, you know, continue using that hybrid approach of, um, you know, activation, making it exciting, making it feel, you know, live and real, but then also stay on top of them, uh, you know, through kind of like a post-trip strategy. So, uh, and then, you know, more importantly, like from a community, community manager perspective, how do you, you know, kind of just engage with people authentically on a day-to-day basis? You know, that might not be media driven. It might be more like in the comments feed or, um, you know, something along those lines, but how do you kind of stay on top of that messaging and, you know, create that opportunity for consumers to interact? Mm-hmm. For sure. Makes tons of sense. So in that same vein too, how do you see, um, I mean, community brand awareness is critical for brands, but oftentimes too, I mean, you tend to have like two camps in marketing. There's kind of the performance marketing side and the, the brand awareness side. I think both are critical. But from your perspective, how do you see the, the connection? Because I, I think, yeah, it's, it's critical to build community, but I just want to make sure that like, 
listeners understand that this isn't just community for the sake of community, uh, but mm -hmm. is ultimately community growth for the sake of business growth. Yeah, I think it goes back to understanding who the consumer is, right? And like, what is the black box? So we've been talking a lot about people-based marketing, for example, these days, um, which can give, you know, like we've got GDPR and the cookie going away and it's going to be harder to track people online, but how can we use techniques, uh, you know, for example, like people-based marketing to connect, um, connect the dots between, you know, that first party data that you're receiving uh, with consumers, you know, showing up to an event, uh, for example, uh, and then how can you connect that with other things that they're interested in, right? So, you know, we're all really dynamic individuals. We're all interested in lots of different things. And if I'm a brand, I want to know exactly what those other things, those people are interested in. Because I think before, you know, before the pandemic, one of the things that we were really trying to drive was partnership, a partnership-based approach, for example. So, you know, experiential marketing is atrociously, atrociously expensive at times. And I remember when I first started Crony, I would always kind of like double take at some of the budgets that we were putting together because I was like, it can't be that much. Um, so it's not like a, it's not a light lift to activate. And so we were trying to pull together, you know, like-minded brands to, um, you know, come together and, uh, you know, co-sponsor activations and things like that. Uh, mainly driven by uh, the community, right? So, uh, kind of an overlap in you know, like for five, you know, three to five brands, their consumers are all um, you know women eighteen to thirty four, and they tend to be interested in wellness. Uh, so, can we develop an activation that's around that, um, or at least speaks to that? For example, so I think that those are going to be big opportunities, um, but it's hard to know where the opportunities lie without really being able to connect the dots on like who these people are and what they're interested in. So again, going back to kind of the data side of things, um, where can we, where can we see the overlap from a community to community perspective and really drive value from that side of things? And I think, you know, uh, if, if brands can figure that out and, and really truly partner together, they can create these mega communities and it's super cool. Yeah, no, I love it. And totally aligned. I think that's why we're here united around the, right. the brand community <laughs> podcast. Um, cool, man. So I, I think as we come towards the end here, uh, as our listeners will soon learn, we're going to have a, a, a recurring question and it's, it's about that time. So if you were going to start a new company from scratch, and let's say this is a, a kind of a direct to consumer product, CPG related mm -hmm. brand, um, First, what, what randomly would the, the product be? And it's just off top. And then how would you go about building that community? Wow, that's a tough question. And I forgot that we had that, that ongoing question. Uh, let's see. What, would I, what company would I make? I think that from a D2C perspective, um, you know, travel related, like I like Away. I like Away a lot. I like the, like, there's obviously been some, um, you know, turmoil over there from an internal perspective. But I think that the travel category is really fascinating um, because it has natural tie-ins, right? You can, um, you can activate an influencer community pretty well. Um, you can activate, organically activate giveaways and things like that. Um, and then people just love to talk about travel, right? So I think that if you were to, you know, it, you know developing a D2C brand around travel, I think would would obviously require a lot of social thought processing, right? Um, but then you can think about, if you think about a brand like So House or, uh, you know, any of these brands that have communities, you know, scattered all throughout the world, there's a huge opportunity to kind of create these IRL, um, you know, community experiences that people can tap into when, if and when the time is right in the future. Um, that you know, where you can kind of create this vortex where you're engaging people on social, but then you're also allowing them to tap into real world experiences um, and you're driving uh, the conversation from that perspective. And people get excited about that. People wanna participate uh, in exciting things. And uh, yeah, I think that that would be the way to do it. And then obviously I think, you know, we just, I just know this for a fact, but I'd make sure that I'd have my e-commerce strategy down pat because uh, almost every single D2C brand I was talking to, uh, you know, pre or once, once the, once COVID really hit, 
uh, there were all, a lot of them were scrambling to really refine their e-commerce strategy and approach and, and make sure that they were nailing that. So, um, yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, sign me up. I'm there. I'll be your first <laughs> customer. Um, cool, man. Well, well Chris, it's, it's always a pleasure getting to collaborate with you. And I know this is, uh, been getting to been friends for a while, been working together professionally a bit more recently. And I think it's, a, it's it still feels like the beginning of a, a fun, beautiful journey, especially with this podcast, man. So, so let's keep Absolutely. it up. And I, uh, <laughs> great to see your continued progress, man. So likewise, get it. amazing. Right. And, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with more episodes soon. Every Tuesday, you know where to find us. Take care. <laughs>